Secadation By Isaac Asimov Audiobook 11 of 14 Palver, and they must have had my description and all the details. Why did he let did he let me go? And Papa smiled broadly over his roast beef. Well, Arcadia, child, it was easy. When you've been dealing with agents and buyers and competing cooperatives, you learn some of the tricks. I've had twenty years or more to learn them in. You see, child, when the lieutenant opened your papers, he found a five hundred credit bill inside, folded up small. Simple, no. I'll pay you back honest, I've got lots of money. Well, Papa's broad face broke into an embarrassed smile, as he waved it away. For a countrywoman Arcadia desisted. But what if he'd taken the money and turned me in anyway? And accused me of bribery? And give up five hundred credits? I know these people better than you do, girl. But Arcadia knew that he did not know people better. Not these people. In her bed that night, she considered carefully, and knew that no bribe would have stopped a police lieutenant in the matter of catching her unless that had been planned. They didn't want to catch her, yet had made every motion of doing so, nevertheless. Why? To make sure she left? And for Tranter? Were the obtuse and soft-hearted couple she was with now only a pair of tools in the hands of the second foundation, as helpless as she herself? They must be. Or were they? It was all so useless. How could she fight them? Whatever she did, it might only be what those terrible omnipotents wanted her to do. Yet she had to outweat them. Had to. Had to. Had to. 16. Beginning of war for reason or reasons unknown to members of the galaxy at the time of the era under discussion, intergalactic standard time defines its fundamental unit, the second, as the time in which light travels 299,776 kilometers. 86,400 seconds are arbitrarily set equal to one intergalactic standard day and 365 of these days to one intergalactic standard year. Why 299,776, or 86,400, or 365? Tradition, says the historian, begging the question. Because of certain and various mysterious numerical relationships, say the mystics, cultists, numerologists, metaphysicists. Because the original home planet of humanity had certain natural periods of rotation and revolution from which those relationships could be derived, say a very few. No one really knew. Nevertheless, the date on which the Foundation cruiser, the Haber Mallow met the Calganian squadron, headed by the Fearless, and, upon refusing to allow a search party to board, was blasted into smoldering wreckage was 185. 11,692 GE. That is, it was the 185th day of the 11,692nd year of the Galactic Era which dated from the accession of the first emperor of the traditional Campbell dynasty. It was also 185, 419 AS. Dating from the birth of Selden. Or 185, 348 YF dating from the establishment of the foundation. On Calgon it was 185, 56 FC. Dating from the establishment of the first citizenship by the mule. In each case, of course, for convenience, the year was so arranged as to yield the same day number regardless of the actual day upon which the era began. And, in addition, to all the millions of worlds of the galaxy, there were millions of local times, based on the motions of their own particular heavenly neighbors. But whichever you choose. 185, 11692-419-348-56. Or anything. 
It was this day which historians later pointed to when they spoke of the start of the Stet Tinian War. Yet to drive. Daryl, it was none of these at all. It was simply and quite precisely the 32nd day since Arcadia had left Terminus. What it cost Daryl to maintain stolidity through these days was not obvious to everyone. But Elvit Semek thought he could guess. He was an old man and fond of saying that his neuronic sheaths had calcified to the point where his thinking processes were stiff and unwieldy. He invited and almost welcomed the universal underestimation of his decaying powers by being the first to laugh at them. But his eyes were none the less seeing for being faded, his mind none the less experienced and wise, for being no longer agile. He merely twisted his pinched lips and said, Why don't you do something about it? The sound was a physical jar to Daryl, under which he winced. He said, gruffly, Where were we? Semek regarded him with grave eyes. You'd better do something about the girl. His sparse, yellow teeth showed in a mouth that was open in inquiry. But Daryl replied coldly, The question is. Can you get a Sims mall for resonator in the range required? Well, I said I could and you weren't listening I'm sorry, Elvet. It's like this. What we're doing now can be more important to everyone in the galaxy than the question of whether Arcadia is safe. At least, to everyone but Arcadia and myself, and I'm willing to go along with the majority. How big would the resonator be? Semek looked doubtful, I don't know. You can find it somewheres in the catalogs. About how big? A ton? A pound? A block long? Oh, I thought you meant exactly. It's a little jigger. He indicated the first joint of his thumb. About that. All right, can you do something like this? He sketched rapidly on the pad he held in his lap, then passed it over to the old physicist, who peered at it doubtfully, then chuckled. You know, the brain gets calcified when you get as old as I am. What are you trying to do? Daryl hesitated. He longed desperately, at the moment, for the physical knowledge locked in the other's brain, so that he need not put his thought into words. But the longing was useless, and he explained. Semek was shaking his head. You'd need hyper relays. The only things that would work fast enough. A thundering lot of them. But it can be built. Well, sure. Can you get all the parts? I mean, without causing comment? In line with your general work. Semek lifted his upper lip. Can't get 50 hyper relays? I wouldn't use that many in my whole life. We're on a defense project, now. Can't you think of something harmless that would use them? We've got the money. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Maybe I can think of something. How small can you make the whole gadget? Hyper relays can be had micro size. Wiring. Tubes. Space, you've got a few hundred circuits there. I know. How big? Semek indicated with his hands. Too big, said Daryl. I've got to swing it from my belt slowly, he was crumpling his sketch into a tight ball. When it was a hard, Yellow grape, he dropped it into the ashtray and it was gone with the tiny white flare of molecular decomposition. He said, who's at your door? Semek leaned over his desk to the little milky screen above the door signal. He said, the young fellow, Anther. Someone with him, too. Daryl scraped his chair back. Nothing about this, Semek, to the others yet. It's deadly knowledge, if they find out, and two lives are enough to risk. Pelia's anther was a pulsing vortex of activity in Semek's office, which, somehow, managed to partake of the age of its occupant. In the slow turgor of the quiet room, the loose, summery sleeves of anther's tunic seemed still a quiver with the outer breezes. He said, Drive. 
Daryl, Drive. Semek. Orm Dirish. The other man was tall. A long straight nose that lent his thin face a saturnine appearance. Drive. Daryl held out a hand. Anther smiled slightly. Police Lieutenant Dirish, he amplified. Then, significantly, of Calgan. And Daryl turned to stare with force at the young man. Police Lieutenant Dirish of Calgan, he repeated, distinctly. And you bring him here. Why? Because he was the last man on Calgan to see your daughter. Hold, man. Anther's look of triumph was suddenly one of concern, and he was between the two, struggling violently with Daryl. Slowly, and not gently, he forced the older man back into the chair. What are you trying to do? Anther brushed a lock of brown hair from his forehead, tossed a hip lightly upon the desk, and swung a leg, thoughtfully. I thought I was bringing you good news. Daryl addressed the policeman directly, what does he mean by calling you the last man to see my daughter? Is my daughter dead? Please tell me without preliminary. His face was white with apprehension. Lieutenant Dirish said expressionlessly, last man on Calgan was the phrase. She's not on Calgan now. I have no knowledge past that. Here, broken Anther, let me put it straight. Sorry if I overplayed the drama a bit, Doc. You're so inhuman about this, I forget you have feelings. In the first place, Lieutenant Dirige is one of us. He was born on Calgan, but his father was a Foundation man brought to that planet in the service of the Mule. I answer for the Lieutenant's loyalty to the Foundation. Now I was in touch with him the day after we stopped getting the daily report from Mun Y. Broke in Daryl, fiercely. I thought it was quite decided that we were not to make a move in the matter. You were risking their lives and ours. Because, was the equally fierce retort, I've been involved in this game for longer than you. Because I know of certain contacts on Calgan of which you know nothing. Because I act from deeper knowledge, do you understand? I think you're completely mad. Will you listen? A pause, and Daryl's eyes dropped. Anther's lips quirked into a half smile, All right, Doc. Give me a few minutes. Tell him, Dirish. Dirish spoke easily. As far as I know, drive. Daryl, your daughter is at Tranter. At least, she had a ticket to Tranter at the Eastern Spaceport. She was with a trading representative from that planet who claimed she was his niece. Your daughter seems to have a queer collection of relatives, doctor. That was the second uncle she had in a period of two weeks, eh? The Trantorian even tried to bribe me. Probably thinks that's why they got away. He smiled grimly at the thought. How was she? Unharmed, as far as I could see frightened. I don't blame her for that. The whole department was after her. I still don't know why. Daryl drew a breath for what seemed the first time in several minutes. He was conscious of the trembling of his hands and controlled them with an effort. Then she's all right. This trading representative, who was he? Go back to him. What part does he play in it? I don't know. Do you know anything about Tranter? I lived there once. It's an agricultural world, now. Exports animal fodder and grains, mostly. High quality. They sell them all over the galaxy. There are a dozen or two farm cooperatives on the planet and each has its representatives overseas. Shrewd sons of guns, too I knew this one's record. He'd been on Calgan before usually with his wife. Perfectly honest. Perfectly harmless. Um mm, -mm said Anther. Arcadia was born in Tranter, wasn't she, Doc? Daryl nodded. It hangs together, 
you see. She wanted to go away. Quickly and far. And Tranter would suggest itself. Don't you think so? Daryl said. Why not back here? Perhaps she was being pursued and felt that she had to double off in a new angle, at drive. Daryl lacked the heart to question further. Well, then, let her be safe on Tranter, or as safe as one could be anywhere in this dark and horrible galaxy. He groped toward the door, felt Anther's light touch on his sleeve, and stopped, but did not turn. Mind if I go home with you, Doc? You're welcome, was the automatic response. By evening, the exterior most reaches of drive. Daryl's personality, the ones that made immediate contact with other people had solidified once more. He had refused to eat his evening meal and had, instead, with feverish insistence, returned to the inchwise advance into the intricate mathematics of encephalographic analysis. It was not till nearly midnight that he entered the living room again. Pelia's anther was still there, twiddling at the controls of the video. The footsteps behind him caused him to glance over his shoulder. Hi. Aren't you in bed yet? I've been spending hours on the video, trying to get something other than bulletins. It seems the F.S. Haber Mallow is delayed in course and hasn't been heard from really? What do they suspect? What do you think? Kalganian skullduggery. There are reports that Kalganian vessels were sighted in the general space sector in which the Haber Mallow was last heard from. Daryl shrugged, and Antha rubbed his forehead doubtfully. Look Doc, he said, why don't you go to Tranter? Why should I? Because you're no good to us here. You're not yourself. You can't be. And you could accomplish a purpose by going to Tranter, too. The old Imperial Library with the complete records of the proceedings of the Selden Commission are there no. The library has been picked clean and it hasn't helped anyone. It helped Ebling Miss once. How do you know? Yes, he said he found the second foundation, and my mother killed him five seconds later as the only way to keep him from unwittingly revealing its location to the mule. But in doing so, she also, you realize, made it impossible ever to tell whether Miss really did know the location. After all, no one else has ever been able to deduce the truth from those records. Ebling Miss, if you'll remember, was working under the driving impetus of the mule's mind. I know that too, but Miss Mind was, by that very token, in an abnormal state. Do you and I know anything about the properties of a mind under the emotional control of another, about its abilities and shortcomings? In any case, I will not go to Tranter. Anther frowned, well, why the vehemence? I merely suggested it as, well, by space, I don't understand you. You look ten years older. You're obviously having a hellish time of it. You're not doing anything of value here. If I were you, I'd go and get the girl. Exactly. It's what I want to do, too. That's why I won't do it. Look, Anther, and try to understand. You're playing. We're both playing with something completely beyond our powers to fight. In cold blood, if you have any, you know that, whatever you may think in your moments of quixoticism. For fifty years, we've known that the Second Foundation is the real descendant and pupil of Seldonian mathematics. What that means, and you know that, too, is that nothing in the galaxy happens which does not play a part in their reckoning. To us, all life is a series of accidents, to be met with by improvisations to them, all life is purposive and should be met by precalculation. But they have their weakness. Their work is statistical and only the mass action of humanity is truly inevitable. Now how I play a part, as an individual, in the foreseen course of history, I don't know. 
Perhaps I have no definite part, since the plan leaves individuals to indeterminacy and free will. But I am important and they... They, you understand. May at least have calculated my probable reaction. So I distrust, my impulses, my desires, my probable reactions. I would rather present them with an improbable reaction. I will stay here, despite the fact that I yearn very desperately to leave. No. Because I yearn very desperately to leave. The younger man smiled sourly. You don't know your own mind as well as they might. Suppose that. Knowing you. They might count on what you think, merely think, is the improbable reaction, simply by knowing in advance what your line of reasoning would be. In that case, there is no escape. For if I follow the reasoning you have just outlined and go to Tranter, they may have foreseen that, too. There is an endless cycle of double 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 crosses. No matter how far I follow that cycle, I can only either go or stay. The intricate act of luring my daughter halfway across the galaxy cannot be meant to make me stay where I am, since I would most certainly have stayed if they had done nothing. It can only be to make me move, and so I will stay. And besides, Anther, not everything bears the breath of the second foundation, not all events are the results of their puppeting. They may have had nothing to do with Arcadia's leave-taking and she may be safe on Tranter when all the rest of us are dead. No, said Anther, sharply, now you are off the track. You have an alternative interpretation. I have. If you'll listen. Oh, go ahead. I don't lack patience. Well, then. How well do you know your own daughter? How well can any individual know any other? Obviously, my knowledge is inadequate. So is mine on that basis, perhaps even more so. But at least, I viewed her with fresh eyes. Item 1. She is a ferocious little romantic, the only child of an ivory tower academician, growing up in an unreal world of video and book film adventure. She lives in a weird self-constructed fantasy of espionage and intrigue. Item 2. She's intelligent about it, intelligent enough to outweed us, at any rate. She planned carefully to overhear our first conference and succeeded. She planned carefully to go to Calgan with Mun and succeeded. Item 3. She has an unholy hero worship of her grandmother. Your mother. Who defeated the mule. I'm right so far, I think. All right, then. Now, unlike you, I've received a complete report from Lt. Dirige and, in addition, my sources of information on Calgan are rather complete, and all sources check. We know, for instance, that Homer Mun, in conference with the Lord of Calgan was refused admission to the Mule's Palace, and that this refusal was suddenly abrogated after Arcadia had spoken to Lady Calia, the first citizen's very good friend. Daryl interrupted. And how do you know all this? For one thing, Mun was interviewed by Dirige as part of the police campaign to locate Arcadia. Naturally, we have a complete transcript of the questions and answers. And take Lady Kalia herself. It is rumored that she has lost Stedden's interest, but the rumor isn't borne out by facts. She not only remains unreplaced, is not only able to mediate the Lord's refusal to Mun into an acceptance, but can even engineer Arcadia's escape openly. Why, a dozen of the soldiers about Stedden's executive mansion testified that they were seen together on the last evening. Yet she remains unpunished. This despite the fact that Arcadia was searched for with every appearance of diligence. But what is your conclusion from all this torrent of ill connection? that Arcadia's escape was arranged. As I said. With this addition. That Arcadia must have known it was arranged, that Arcadia, the bright little girl who saw cabals everywhere, saw this one and followed your own type of reasoning. 
They wanted her to return to the Foundation, and so she went to Trantor, instead. But why Trantor? Well, why? Because that is where Bida, her idolized grandmother, escaped when she was in flight. Consciously or unconsciously, Arcadia imitated that. I wonder, then, if Arcadia was fleeing the same enemy. The mule. Asked Daryl with polite sarcasm. Of course not. I mean, by the enemy, a mentality that she could not fight. She was running from the second foundation, or such influence thereof as could be found on Calgon. What influence is this you speak of? Do you expect Calgon to be immune from that ubiquitous menace? We both have come to the conclusion, somehow, that Arcadia's escape was arranged. Right? She was searched for and found, but deliberately allowed to slip away by Dirish. By Dirish, do you understand? But how was that? Because he was our man. But how did they know that? Were they counting on him to be a traitor? Eh, Doc. Now you're saying that they honestly meant to recapture her. Frankly, you're tiring me a bit, Anther. Finish your say, I want to go to bed. My say is quickly finished. Anther reached for a small group of photo records in his inner pocket. It was the familiar wigglings of the encephalograph. Dirija's brainwaves, Anther said, casually, taken since he returned. It was quite visible to Daryl's naked eye and his face was grey when he looked up. He is controlled. Exactly. He allowed Arcadia to escape not because he was our man but because he was the second foundations. Even after he knew she was going to Trantor, and not to Terminus. Anther shrugged. He had been geared to let her go. There was no way he could modify that. He was only a tool, you see. It was just that Arcadia followed the least probable course, and is probably safe. Or at least safe until such time as the Second Foundation can modify the plans to take into account this changed state of affairs he paused. The little signal light on the video set was flashing. On an independent circuit, it signified the presence of emergency news. Daryl saw it, too and with the mechanical movement of long habit turned on the video. They broke in upon the middle of a sentence but before its completion, they knew that the hover mellow, or the wreck thereof, had been found and that, for the first time in nearly half a century, the Foundation was again at war. Anther's jaw was set in a hard line. All right, Doc, you heard that. Calgan has attacked and Calgan is under the control of the Second Foundation. Will you follow your daughter's lead and move to Trantor? No. I will risk it. Here. Drive. Daryl. You are not as intelligent as your daughter. I wonder how far you can be trusted. His long level stare held Daryl for a moment, and then without a word, he left and Daryl was left in uncertainty and almost despair. Unheeded, the video was a medley of excited sights sound, as it described in nervous detail the first hour of the war between Calgan and the Foundation. 17. War the mayor of the Foundation brushed futilely at the picket fence of hair that rimmed his skull. He sighed. The years that we have wasted, the chances we have thrown away. I make no recriminations, drive. Daryl, but we deserve defeat. Daryl said, quietly, I see no reason for lack of confidence in events, sir. Lack of confidence. Lack of confidence. By the galaxy, drive. Daryl, on what would you base any other attitude? Come here he half-led half-forced Daryl toward the limpid ovoid cradled gracefully on its tiny force field support. At a touch of the mayor's hand, it glowed within. An accurate three-dimensional model of the galactic double spiral. In yellow, said the mayor, excitedly, 
we have that region of space under foundation control, in red, that under Calgon. What Daryl saw was a crimson sphere resting within a stretching yellow fist that surrounded it on all sides but that toward the center of the galaxy. Galactography, said the mayor, is our greatest enemy. Our admirals make no secret of our almost hopeless, strategic position. Observe. The enemy has inner lines of communication. He is concentrated, can meet us on all sides with equal ease. He can defend himself with minimum force. We are expanded. The average distance between inhabited systems within the Foundation is nearly three times that within Calgon. To go from Sant Anni to Lacris, for instance, is a voyage of 2500 parsecs for us, but only 800 parsecs for them, if we remain within our respective territories Daryl said, I understand all that, sir. And you do not understand that it may mean defeat. There is more than distance to war. I say we cannot lose. It is quite impossible. And why do you say that? Because of my own interpretation of the Selden plan. Oh, the mayor's lips twisted, and the hands behind his back flapped one within the other, then you rely, too, on the mystical help of the second foundation. No. Merely on the help of inevitability. And of courage and persistence. And yet behind his easy confidence, he wondered what if well what if Anther were right and Calgon were a direct tool of the mental wizards. What if it was their purpose to defeat and destroy the Foundation? No. It made no sense. And yet he smiled bitterly. Always the same. Always that peering and peering through the opaque granite which, to the enemy, was so transparent. Nor were the galactographic verities of the situation lost upon Stedon. The Lord of Calgon stood before a twin of the galactic model which the mayor and Daryl had inspected. Except that where the mayor frowned, Stedden smiled. His admiral's uniform glistered imposingly upon his massive figure. The crimson sash of the Order of the Mule awarded him by the former first citizen whom six months later he had replaced somewhat forcefully, spanned his chest diagonally from right shoulder to waist. The silver star with double comets and swords sparkled brilliantly upon his left shoulder. He addressed the six men of his general staff whose uniforms were only less grandiloquent than his own, and his first minister as well, thin and grey. A darkling cobweb, lost in the brightness. Stedden said, I think the decisions are clear. We can afford to wait. To them, every day of delay will be another blow at their morale. If they attempt to defend all portions of their realm, they will be spread thin and we can strike through in two simultaneous thrusts here and here. He indicated the directions on the galactic model. Two lances of pure white shooting through the yellow fist from the red ball it enclosed, cutting Terminus off on either side in a tight arc. In such a manner, we cut their fleet into three parts which can be defeated in detail. If they concentrate, they give up two-thirds of their dominions voluntarily and will probably risk rebellion. The First Minister's thin voice alone seeped through the hush that followed. In six months, he said, the Foundation will grow six months stronger. Their resources are greater, as we all know, their navy is numerically stronger, their manpower is virtually inexhaustible. Perhaps a quick thrust would be safer. His was easily the least influential voice in the room. Lord Stedden smiled and made a flat gesture with his hand. The six months. Or a year, if necessary. Will cost us nothing. The men of the Foundation cannot prepare, they are ideologically incapable of it. It is in their very philosophy to believe that the second Foundation will save them. But not this time, Et. The men in the room stirred uneasily. You lack confidence, I believe, said Stedden, frigidly. Is it necessary once again to describe the reports of our agents in Foundation territory, or to repeat the findings of Mr. Homir Mun, 
the foundation agent now in our uh, service? Let us adjourn, gentlemen. Stedden returned to his private chambers with a fixed smile still on his face. He sometimes wondered about this home ear mun. A queer water-spined fellow who certainly did not bear out his early promise. And yet he crawled with interesting information that carried conviction with it. Particularly when Kalia was present. His smile broadened. That fat fool had her uses, after all. At least, she got more with her wheedling out of Mun than he could, and with less trouble. Why not give her to Mun? He frowned. Kalia. She and her stupid jealousy. Space. If he still had the Daryl girl why hadn't he ground her skull to powder for that? He couldn't quite put his finger on the reason. Maybe because she got along with Mun. And he needed Mun. It was Mun, for instance, who had demonstrated that, at least in the belief of the mule, there was no second foundation. His admirals needed that assurance. He would have liked to make the proofs public, but it was better to let the foundation believe in their non-existent help. Was it actually Kalia who had pointed that out? That's right. She had said oh, nonsense. She couldn't have said anything. And yet he shook his head to clear it and passed on. 18. Ghost of a World Tranter was a world in dregs and rebirth. Set like a faded jewel in the midst of the bewildering crowd of suns at the center of the galaxy. In the heaps and clusters of stars piled high with aimless prodigality. It alternately dreamed of past and future. Time had been when the insubstantial ribbons of control had stretched out from its metal coating to the very edges of stardom. It had been a single city, housing 400 billion administrators, the mightiest capital that had ever been. Until the decay of the empire eventually reached it and in the great sack of a century ago, its drooping powers had been bent back upon themselves and broken forever. In the blasting ruin of death, the metal shell that circled the planet wrinkled and crumpled into an aching mock of its own grandeur. The survivors tore up the metal plating and sold it to other planets for seed and cattle. The soil was uncovered once more and the planet returned to its beginnings. In the spreading areas of primitive agriculture, it forgot its intricate and colossal past. Or would have but for the still mighty shards that heaped their massive ruins toward the sky in bitter and dignified silence. Arcadia watched the metal rim of the horizon with a stirring of the heart. The village in which the Palvers lived was but a huddle of houses to her. Small and primitive. The fields that surrounded it were golden yellow, wheat siog tracks. But there, just past the reaching point was the memory of the past, still glowing in unrusted splendor, and burning with fire where the son of Tranter caught it in gleaming highlights. She had been there once during the months since she had arrived at Tranter. She had climbed onto the smooth, unjointed pavement and ventured into the silent dust-streaked structures, where the light entered through the jags of broken walls and partitions. It had been solidified heartache. It had been blasphemy. She had left, clangingly. Running until her feet pounded softly on earth once more. And then she could only look back longingly. She dared not disturb that mighty brooding once more. Somewhere on this world, she knew, she had been born. Near the old imperial library, which was the veriest tranter of tranter. It was the sacred of the sacred, the holy of holies. Of all the world, it alone had survived the great sack and for a century it had remained complete and untouched defiant of the universe. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.